Turn with me, please, in your Bibles today to the Gospel of Luke. Luke's Gospel and chapter 22. Luke 22. We're going to be looking at this portion of Scripture in a little while as we have the privilege today of celebrating the Lord's Supper. Now, you know that we've been going through the book of Romans in chapter 3 and looking at various aspects and the nature of man's heart and their sinfulness. And I'm very sensitive to having preached on something like that on a Father's Day a number of years ago and uh, to the shock of those fathers that were sitting there with their little kids and I'm preaching on sin and, and I just decided I won't do that again. So. Uh, today we're going to look at something else, and especially wonderful because today, being Father's Day, we're going to look at what Christ has done for us. We do thank all of you fathers for all your faithfulness to your children. We thank you for all the things that you do. We wish you a happy Father's Day. It's biblical. The scripture tells us to honor our fathers, and so we do thank you for all that you do. And that's a fact. Most fathers do all kinds of things for their children. They do it many different ways. Now, I know there are exceptions. I know there are cruel dads. I've been exposed to some of that. I know there are deadbeat dads and things of that nature. But for the most part, fathers love their children and do very many things things for them. They do a lot for their children that they may not, the children may not even know. I know some fathers who have worked two and three jobs to provide for their children. I know fathers that have sacrificed to give to their children that their children may have what they need. They love their kids and they do all kinds of things to provide for their children. They do it for their kids. What they do, they do for their children. Now today, what I want for us to see is what Christ has done for God's children the family of Christ, the family of God. I want for us to look at the scriptures and see what Jesus has done for us. A few moments ago, Daniel read that passage to us from the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. He read from chapter 23, including the account of the death, the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, prior to the actual crucifixion, we know that he was beaten. We know that he was scourged. So by the time you get to the crucifixion, he's already bloodied. He's already beaten. He's already battered. He already has a crown of thorns on his head. Blood would have been flowing down from the wounds on his head. Blood would have been pouring out from the wounds on his back. His face would have been disfigured. He would have been swollen. And now the guards come and they take his arm and they stretch it out and they drive a spike through his wrist and they drive a spike through the other wrist and they lift him up and they drive the nail through his ankles and here's God, here's the Son of God, hanging on a tree, becoming a curse, as it were. Bloody, beaten, dying. The pain would have been in, in, incomprehensible for us. But this is Jesus, this is the Son of God. That's what Daniel read a little while ago. This is what Jesus went through. Blood from his wrists, blood from his feet, blood from his head, blood from his back. Bloody, bloody death. Why? Why did he do that? Here in Luke 22, we see Jesus speak of what actually was happening. And he speaks of the Lord's Supper. And we're going to come back to this, but I want you to look at verse 19. 
And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is what this is. A remembrance of Christ. Now let me ask you this. Do you think that he was saying that we are to take the Lord's Supper, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to remember his pain and his suffering alone? Just remember that he went through a very grueling, bloody death on the cross? Is that all that it means? I don't think so, no. We're remembering the supernatural element of what Christ did when he went to the cross as well. Yes, we do remember that he gave his life. We do remember. We cannot forget the cruel, bloody nature of his death, the pain that he suffered. It ought to stir our hearts with emotion. But we also want to understand why he did it and what he was doing beyond the mere physical element of the crucifixion. What was he doing when he died on the cross? And why was he doing it? That's what I want for us to take up today. I want for us to look at the atonement made on the cross, Jesus shedding his blood for us. Did you get that? His blood shed for us. Not for himself, but for us. This is what theologians call the vicarious nature of the sacrificial death of Christ. The vicarious nature of his sacrifice. Now perhaps that word is not familiar to you. So what I would like for us to do is to go through the scripture and see several texts from God's word. It will be like a Bible study. Several texts from God's word that show us the vicarious nature of Jesus' sacrifice. And the first place I would ask you to turn this morning is going to be John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Because the first thing I want for us to see or to have is a vital understanding of Christ's sacrifice. And we want to see and to know in our hearts and in our minds, first of all, first and foremost, that his death was not deserved. His death was not a criminal's death. There was no reason for Jesus to have gone to the cross for himself. He did nothing to deserve going to the cross. This is his own testimony. Right here in John chapter 8, look down to what he says in verse 46. And I'm going to have to go quick. Just touch on some things, and you'll get the, the, the gist of the text. Jesus says in verse 46, Which one of you convicts me of sin? Who convicted Jesus of sin? Who was there that could point to any sin that Jesus had committed? No one. He committed no sin. There was no sin in him. None at all. This was even the governor, the testimony of the governor. If you look over to chapter 19. Chapter 19 of John and verse 4. Here's what Pilate said. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. He had no guilt. He was not crucified because he was guilty. He did not go to the cross because he deserved it. It was not for anything that he had done. 
It was not for anything for who he was. If you look at the Gospel of Matthew, and if you look at the Gospel of Mark, it tells us that Pilate knew that they had lifted him up or delivered him up because of envy. Not because of sin, not because of guilt, not because of anything that he himself did. The one who was on trial was not the criminal. The ones who delivered him up, they were the criminals. The one who went to the cross was not a criminal. The ones who crucified him, they were the criminals. Our Lord Jesus was not guilty. He was not a criminal, and he did nothing worthy of death. Just listen to this. He was not on the cross because of any crime that he committed. He was the spotless, sinless Lamb of God who was on the cross for us. Yeah. And that's where we're going. That's what we're going to see regarding the vicarious nature. He was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. And of course from Hebrews chapter 4. So his death on the cross was not for him. It was a sacrificial death for us. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 2. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant woman. His was a sacrificial death. He was offering up himself as that spotless, sinless lamb, offering up himself as a sacrifice for us to God. This was the nature of the death of Christ. This is what was happening. Now, once again, it says it here in this text, but what we want to now focus in on is why he did this. Why did he give his life? Why did he go to the cross? And the answer takes us to that word, vicarious. It was not for himself, it was for others. That's pretty much what vicarious means. On behalf of, in the place of others. And in this case, it's in the place of you. It's in the place of every one of you who is saved by his sacrifice. The vicarious nature of the death of Christ is that he did it for you. This is what we see from the scriptures. Turn, if you would, please, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And what we're going to do, as I said, look at several passages as he tells us that his sacrifice on the cross was not for himself, but it was for us. And the first testimony I want to see regarding this is from Jesus himself. Jesus himself tells us why he went to the cross. Now people, I am only going to mention a few texts. I know there's a lot that you're going to be turning in your Bibles, but this is only a specimen example. Just a handful of the many, many texts that show us the vicarious nature of Jesus' sacrificial death. But right here in Matthew chapter 20, he tells us himself in verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to what class? To give his life a ransom for many. He didn't give his life for sins that he committed, he didn't give his life for everyone, but he gave his life a ransom for many. He gave his life for us. That's his own testimony. This is why I came. Jesus, why'd you come? 
Why, why did you come to earth? Why did you live as a man? Why did you go through all of this? I came to give my life for my sheep, for my people, for men. That's what Jesus tells us himself right here in Matthew chapter 20. Now, I want to turn to another passage. Now, you have to remember the term ransom before I go. The term ransom, of course, implies that we were being held captive. And a ransom needed to be paid. And that's what we've been seeing in Romans, right? As we've been going through Romans chapter 3 and seeing the various sins and the sinful nature of man, that we're held captive to sin. That left to ourselves, we can't do anything about it because remember, we just saw last week that our sins are nothing but filthy rags. We can't do anything to save ourselves. So we need somebody to pay the ransom. And Jesus says, that's why I came. That's why I came. Now look at that passage we read a portion of in John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And here, Jesus tells us that he's going to lay down his life for his sheep. What he did when he went to the cross is for us. If you would, please... Look down to verse, now we read the first 10 chapters, 10 verses rather, of chapter 10. Look down to verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. Read a little further. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am a good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus did not give his life on the cross because he deserved to die. Because he was a criminal. Jesus purposefully, intentionally, gave his life. He laid his life down. He didn't take it from him. He laid it down. Why? For the sheep. I lay my life down for the sheep. He's the owner. He loves his sheep. And he gives his life for the sheep. Notice he's not giving his life for the goats. He's giving his life for the sheep. His sheep. My sheep know me. They hear my voice and they follow me. Those are the ones he laid his life down for. But it's for us, the sheep. That's the vicarious nature of the sacrifice of Jesus. He did it on our behalf, on behalf of the sheep. Okay, so that's what Jesus says in just a couple, just two verses of what Jesus said. There's so many others. Let's look at a few that Paul says. The Apostle Paul. Again, just samples. There are many more. But look what he says in Romans chapter 5. And Romans chapter 5 is where we are headed in our current study through the book of Romans. We're going to be looking at the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5. We haven't even got past verse 1 yet. But we will. And this is what comes up. And this is what is going to sh show us the surety of our salvation. That's the title of the whole series, in case you forgot. The surety of our salvation. And here we have the Apostle Paul telling us, knowing that we're sinners, knowing how bad we are, he says in verse 8, But God demonstrated, or demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. That's the vicarious nature of the sacrifice of Christ. 
We're helpless sinners. We're unworthy sinners. That's what he's going through in those verses and chapters that we've been looking at. Under the wrath of God. Lost. Unrighteous. All these things that we've been saying. We're that way. And yet Christ died for us. The vicarious nature of his sacrifice. We're helpless. Unable to save ourselves. And yet he gave his life for our, our salvation. Look at another. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. We have here the first few verses of this chapter. This is a great chapter to speak about on Resurrection Sundays especially. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. What's the gospel? And he tells us. The gospel which I preach to you, which you also receive, in which also you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. First and foremost, center of the Gospel, first place in the Gospel, we're sinners. Christ died for our sins. That's the vicarious nature of the sacrificial death of Jesus. He did it for us. Christ died for our sins. And of course we know if you look over to Ephesians, well, you know what? I'm going to have to skip Ephesians. Look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. Now we see here in this verse, it's packed, full, it's packed full of great theology. Great lessons right in this one verse. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Now obviously... They're talking about the, the, the uh, scripture is referring back to a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verses 22 to 23, speaking of the fact that anyone who is hanged on a tree or is hung becomes a curse. They're cursed. And this is referring to Jesus hanging on the cross. And so in that sense, he became a curse. He became a curse as he is looked at as a criminal. One giving his life, being hanged as a criminal. He became the curse. But we know that's not why he was being crucified. He was not a criminal. And so why, Paul, why did he become a curse? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. All that he did was for us. Just think about what it must have been like for our dear Lord. We already talked about the pain, the suffering. You, know, you ever think of the embarrassment? He's cursed. They're spitting at him. He's naked. It's humiliating. It's horrible. And this is the Son of God. He's become a curse. The scribes and the Pharisees and the people pass by. They're wagging their fingers at him. Ha! You who are going to save him, blah, blah, come down from the cross. They're mocking him, spitting at him, <coughs> cursing at him because he was a curse. 
why did he go through all of that? For you. To redeem us from the curse of the law. And so we can say from the text that Jesus became a curse for us so that we would not be accursed before God. He became a curse for us so that in the eyes of God we would not be accursed. That we would be righteous. Once again, using the language of being redeemed. Paying the price. Setting us free from the bondage of sin. Us. Setting us free. That is why he went to the cross. I must hurry on. Let's look at what Peter says. Let's go to the Apostle Peter. You know, if anybody would know about the vicarious nature of the sacrifice of Jesus, it would have been Peter. Peter. First Peter chapter 2. And we just looked at this text like a week ago. Last week, maybe. But I want to look at it from a different light. You know you can do that with texts. You can... Look at a text in one way and glean something from it. Or you can look at it another way and get something else from it. And right here I want for us to just focus on what he says regarding us. Verse 24, 1 Peter 2. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds... You are healed. You see that? I care is. He did it. He went to the cross. But because he went to the cross, your wounds are healed. He received wounds that your wounds would be healed. That's the vicarious nature of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving his life, bearing our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. <laughs> Turn over, or just look over, same book, chapter 3. Look down to verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once. For all the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. But look, he was just. Remember, that's how we started. We started by looking at the vital, a vital understanding of Christ's sacrifice. He was just. He did not go to the cross because he was sinful or he had committed any sin. He was just. He was not a sinner. He was just. But we are unjust. We are the lost. We are the sinners. So the just went to the cross for the unjust, you and me. That's my curious. He did it for us, even though he didn't have to, even though there wasn't any reason for him to. He was just, he was perfect, he was holy, but he went to the cross, the just, to give his life for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. How is it that you are brought to God? Because the just and holy Jesus Christ vicariously gave his life on the cross that you would become just in the eyes of God. That's how we come to God. 
And so, my friends, that is the vicarious nature of the sacrificial death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all of these that I've mentioned, Jesus and, and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, they all, they all talk about this and they tell us that that's why Jesus went to the cross. And I, I believe with all of my heart that every one of you that's saved here today could chime in with them. And you'd say, yes, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve judgment. And I know that Jesus gave his life for me, that I would be saved. We know it. We know we're sinners. And we know the joy of being saved by the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus. So, a vital understanding of the sacrificial death, the vicarious nature of his sacrificial death, and I close with the very nearness of Christ's sacrificial death. The very nearness to us today. This table reminds us that his sacrifice was not bound to time or place. Jesus did not give his life for everybody that was around him and the disciples there 2,000 years ago, and that's it. All of those there in Palestine, on the Mount Calvary, Jesus gave his life, and it was effectual for all of those around them. He didn't give his life just for those. He didn't give his life for the early church, the Apostle Paul and Peter, and those things that we read. It's not bound by time. It's not bound by space. It's not bound by location. Just giving his life for people in a land far, far away. But rather, his sacrificial death, pictured by this table before us today, reminds us that his sacrificial death was vicarious for us. The very nearness of the sacrificial death of Christ. It's for us here today. Not just for people long ago and far away, but God so loved His Son that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish. And that's throughout the ages, through new and different lands. God gave His Son and poured out his wrath upon his son for me. Christ gave his life and went to the cross and shed his blood for me. The Holy Spirit took the word of God and opened my heart and opened my mind that I would see these things for myself. The vicarious nature of Christ's death applied to you. That's what we're remembering today. That's what we have here before us. Jesus lovingly, willingly went to the cross for us. And although it was 2,000 years ago, it's still for us. It's still for his people today. So Christ's Sacrificial death, and this is the word you can remember now, is a vicarious death. His sacrificial death from God's mercy and His grace was for you. Not for Himself, but for you. This is what we remember today, and this is what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper as we do. Let's pray. Father, I think that sometimes we read these things and we just kind of go through them quickly and don't grasp the significance. But you gave your life for us. You did 
did not have to go to the cross. It was not from you. But he gave his life a ransom for men. God, thank you for sending your son. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross. Holy Spirit, thank you for helping us to know or for making us know. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, thank you for our salvation in Christ that we remember today. Bless our time in the scriptures and bless our time as we receive this this remembrance of bread in the cup, and bless our time in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Amen.